Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we have a very distinguished panel for the webinar. Dr. Adam Matut, uh, who's currently the Director for Transitional Year Residency Training Program at the Hackensack Meridian, and Dr. Weissman, who's a co ryan faculty and lead researcher there. So we'll talk about all aspects of the residency math for IMGs, personal statement, interviewing, ERAS, CV, rotations, research, mm -hmm. their importance, and so on. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Atut and Dr. Weissman. We are glad to have you with us today. Uh, let's start with a bit of an introduction. Uh, Dr. Weissman, uh, do you want to start and we'll see what's... So uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Puan, for, for organizing this. Um, you know, Dr. Atut and myself, we, we work very, very closely um, with medical students um, and residents um, in the training program across a couple of training programs, not just internal medicine um, and, and the TY, but we're also involved with a lot of the family medicine residents and students. Um, and one of the things that we are, are really, our main goal is to sort of give a lot of the IMGs who are super, super qualified um, and and are are really um, excellent um, clinicians and excellent students. And unfortunately, the window um, for them is is not always um, so so available and so easy to get into. So Dr. Trude and I sort of um, started working very closely um, with 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 IMGs and the IMG community to really give them a, a chance to sort of present themselves in person um, and and really. Um, give give away via seminars like this and webinars um, such as this to to um, really get information about how to proceed what the next best step for you is um, what will stand out on your CV um, so I, just a quick introduction about myself um, as Juan thank you so much for that introduction I'm, I'm one of the core faculty members um, here in the internal medicine training program um, at Palisades part of Hackensack network um, we know a lot of doctors in the network um, we interview uh, I've interviewed over 250, maybe even closer to 500 uh, um, students over the past two years for the program, um, and and I'm I'm happy to be here and answer questions. Um, and I'll I'll guess kind of turn over the the, the um, stage to Dr. Atut, who's the program director and also core faculty of the medicine program, and has years and years of experience working with students and a resident for for a few words introduction. So it's it's nice to meet everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, Panam. Thank you for setting this up. So um, I'm. Uh, one of the residency program directors in the hospital. I run the transitional year residency program. Um, uh, I also am core faculty like Simca for uh, the internal medicine and family medicine uh, residencies. And I'm a professor of medicine at the School of Medicine for Hackensack. Um, so we have a lot of experience. You know, our, our program, we, inter we get a lot, of, a lot of applicants, about 3,000 applicants a year. And we interview about 400 for 18 positions. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll guide you guys as much as we can. And I know... For IMGs, um, I myself am an IMG, so I, I know the process of, um, sometimes it can get a little bit uh, confusing, so hopefully we can clarify some things today. Thank you both. Uh, so now let's just dive in, but a bit of a housekeeping before that uh, to our audience. If you have questions, we'll probably take it towards the end, but I will keep an eye out on the chat. So if you can just hold on to the questions, we already have a set of questions that we are going to go through. So Dr. Atut, you mentioned about residency interviews. So can you tell us a bit about the interviews from your perspective, especially uh, as IMGs are interviewing? What was it like and uh, so on? So just on a bit, throw a bit of a light on the interviewing process. Sure. I mean, I think uh, the past year has been, and, and I think Dr. S Dr. Wiseman can agree, it's been a little bit different than we usually have experienced it. The, the past year has been virtual only, so um, due to COVID, obviously. So, so the interview process, um, you know, it, you can't feel someone out as much on the virtual stage. So your CV really has to stand out now, right? Especially th this upcoming year may not be in person also, it might be a combination of both. I think most programs and most P PDs I spoke to are planning to do a combination of both virtual and in person. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that means if you're going to do virtual and you won't stand out as much because of the lag, your CV has to kind of stand out a little bit more. Um, and then for IMGs, the challenges are different. Everybody has different timelines when they graduated, what career path they took. Um, things that we look for are obviously, scores is one thing, 
but we look for clinical experience in the U.S., especially if, if, you're, if you went to a foreign medical school. Uh, we look for research and, and we look for um, letters of recommendation, which I think are very, very important, um, especially if it comes from academic faculty, other residency program directors. Um, that means a lot because those are people that deal with um, residency applicants. And so if they're recommending you highly, write you a strong letter, I think that means a lot for me as a program director. Thanks, sir. Uh, Dr. Weissman, uh, could you want to chip in? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I wanted to echo a lot of what Dr. Atut said. Um, obviously, very important. Um, I want to add one thing here, and, and this is, has to do with the sort of the step one exam becoming pass fail. Um, you know, and I, I spoke to a lot of faculty members and, and, and the program director that I work with in the internal medicine program and the associate program director. And, you know, we all kind of came to a consensus that um, because the step one now is pass fail, which used to be a more of um, a, a weeding point or a screening point for the, um, you know, the applicants. So not only is this going to put weight on step two, but it's going to what it's going to do is it's going to say, okay, you know, now that the base, we don't know so much about their first two years of medical school. We don't know so much about their basic science scores in comparison. So let's see now what these students do in terms of their clinical experience, in terms of their research experience, because now we're shifting some of the focus from the scores and the medical knowledge to, okay, in person, how are they? How are they impressing attendings when they do, you know, clinical research? Um, how much are they impressed? You know, what kind of research can they bring to your program if they come? Do they have any research experience? So it's shifting the focus on a more wholesome applicant. Um, so that's something to be very wary of, come, come, you know, moving forward. Okay. So we'll we'll come to research in a bit, but uh, I wanted to also get your thoughts on now the personal statement. You know, how important are these? So Dr. Atut, you spoke about the IDAS CV. So uh, can you talk a bit about the personal statement? Sure. I think the personal statement is very, very important, um, especially it's, a, it's kind of a window into your communication skills, right? So if you're an IMG, one of the things that I look for personally is I'll, the personal statement will tell me, do you have good grasp of the English language? Can you communicate pretty well? And then obviously we'll dive more into that during the interview. I will tell you that, um, the personal statement is not something that's going to get you an interview. I mean, put yourself in the positions of uh, a program director or the faculty. If you get 3,000 applicants, imagine how long it would take to read 3,000 personal statements <laughs> yes. the entire interview season. So the personal statement isn't what's going to get you the interview. However, when you get the interview, your personal statement will be dissected pretty, pretty well. And so like if you're part of that 400 people that we're interviewing, of course, we're going to read it. And um, I would highly suggest that if you're an IMG, and you get, even if you're not an IMG, I think everybody should have someone else read it, especially somebody who has good proficiency with the English language. Uh, there are programs that assist you with that just to make sure there's no grammatical errors, that it, it sounds and flows well. But that's not something that will get you an interview. It's just, it's something that when we interview you, we'll, we'll highlight, like, you know, it'll be something we talk about in the interview. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Weissman, and maybe I'll come back to Dr. Atut. What are the kind of things that, impress the interviewing panel. Both of you obviously have been on so many panels. So Dr. Weissman, maybe I'll start with you. Uh, what are the top things? Yeah. So um, so just uh, sticking from an interview perspective, like what on the actual interview day will impress the, the, um, the, you know, the panel? Usually there's one, sometimes two people, um, two of the core faculty members, including plus minus the APD and the PD in the room when you interview. So you know, what's going to really impress them is um, somebody who's able to sort of, and what this question we get asked a lot and, and, and sort of I, we phrased it in this way, like tell, if they're able to tell you about themselves um, and, and their strengths without actually saying it. So my example is like this, if you're able on the interview to portray that you're somebody who's um, has great time management skills, um, somebody who's hardworking, somebody who's easy to work with, won't cause friction in the program. Those three things, hardworking, easy to work with, um, and somebody who's, um, who has good um, communication interpersonal skills. Um, but you can't say, if they ask you on the interview, um, tell me about yourself. Oh, I'm very, we hear this, we hear this all the time. You know, um, I, I'm very smart. I, I get along very well with people. It's so cliche and it's, it's, it almost sounds immature. So we, we want the applicant to tell us these things 
but not actually say them. Give up, give, give like tell us like, oh, you know, be like for example, would be something like this. You know, I, you know, I, I, um, you know, I, I did a, a rotation at this hospital, and I, some of the feedback I got it was that I'm very easy to, you know, I'm easy to get along with, um, and had a great experience there, and you know, I, I look forward to opportunities, clinical opportunities. So this shows you're mature. This shows that you could, um, you have good interpersonal skills without sort of bragging about yourself because it comes off the wrong way if that's how it's said. Yep, yep, thank you. Uh, Dr. Atut, uh, do you have anything to add here in terms of what impresses you? I mean, honestly, man, it's, it's a very loaded question. It might take me like a day to answer that. Um, it, it, everybody has different paths. It depends on the applicant where it is. But generally, you're looking for somebody who's hardworking. You're, you're looking for somebody that ultimately cares about patients, right, can show me that they will put the patient first. Ultimately, we all want to be doctors. We all went into medicine for one reason. So I'm looking for people that are very hungry to learn medicine, because if you don't have that hunger, me as a program director, I can't get you to the next level. So, and somebody that I think will flow well with the team. I mean, ultimately medicine now is, is a team sport and uh, kind of like what Dr. Wiseman just said, what Simka said, uh, those are very important to highlight. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, before we proceed, I, I did want to introduce to our audience uh, that uh, Dr. Weissman and Dr. Atut will be uh, doing some programs around rotations. So there are these programs uh, that uh, they'll help our students with both in rotations, tele-rotations and research. So Dr. Weissman, do you want to spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, how you've structured this? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so Dr. Atut and I, just a little background on this, we we sort of, um, you know, put pen to the paper and and said sort of how can we create the proper window um, for a lot of the students that can't physically be here, um, you know, because, you know, ultimately some of these are great doctors and we touched on this earlier, some of these are great students and they're going to make great doctors. So um, how can we sort of give them an opportunity? And and a lot of this reason comes from the, the fact that Dr. Toot and myself in our programs had a star, star residents who were IMGs from Pakistan, from India, and not just from here in the United States. If not, they were better than a lot of our doctors here. And in order to reach these um, applicants and to really get them interviewed and ultimately, you know, enroll them and rank them high and accept them, we want them to be able to showcase themselves, even if it's difficult for them to sort of get here and spend a few months here because of travel and, you know, time and, 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 and finances, et cetera. So we put our pen to paper and we said, what can we do? So just briefly, one of the things we did is we we created a, a virtual um, a hospital based rotation in which we we go through real patient experiences, real patient stays in the hospital, um, and we kind of summarize their hospital stay. Um, and we use this as a um, not just a, a didactic and, and teach, but really a way to to teach like hospital based medicine by going through patient labs, um, patient imaging, chest X-rays, EKGs of a whole hospitalization and admission of some of the bread and butter and the core cases in internal medicine. Um, and we we aren't really using this to to um, grade and no, we're kind of using this as a teaching session, but also a way for these students to sort of be interactive and ask good questions and show interest. Um, and then we obviously would provide a letter, which not just for our programs, but we want it to help them for all of the programs that they can apply to, to sort of give them a U.S. physician letter at the end of it and, and allow them to showcase some skills and learn and learn a lot of hospital based on um, internal medicine. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction on this, Dr. Weissman. And to our audience, uh, these details are on our website. So I'll probably put the link uh, in the chat as well. But if you're interested, take a look at our uh, website, uh, usmlesarthi.com. Okay, uh, moving on, you know, uh, before we switch into this season and what applicants should do, uh, let's talk a bit about SOAP. You know, this is one process for unmatched IMGs, which is very, very stressful. So Dr. Toot, uh, can you talk a bit about SOAP? Did your program participate and any reflections you have from uh, this past season's round, SOAP rounds? Sure. I mean, so um, unfortunately our, our program Fortunately or unfortunately, we're a very competitive um, program. And so we, because we get so many applicants, uh, we generally never need to soak. We fill our programs quite easily. So I think for medicine, uh, we, you know, we filled every spot for my program. We filled all 18 positions. Um, we've never really had to participate in soap. However, I do highly advise um, IMGs that if you don't, you know, if you don't match in the, in the main match to participate, because you really have nothing to lose if there's extra spots there. It would be a good idea to reach out to these programs through um, the appropriate channels and see if you can match there. Uh, but our program, you know, we, we generally don't need to soap. 
Okay. So let's continue with you. Uh, uh, if someone did not match the season, so maybe repeat applicant IMG, uh, what should their priority be? Okay. So this is, this is very important, right? So number one, you don't want to have any gaps in your, in your CV that are essentially not filled with clinical work. You're trying to become a physician, right? So like I'll see, I'll see doctors, they'll take a year or two off to, get, to go get like a master's of business administration. That's great that you got an MBA, but that's not going to help you in residency, right? So what's better is for you to do clinical externships, ideally with academic faculty, so residency program directors, associate PDs, core faculty in hospitals that can not only give you the best type of clinical experience, but also they can potentially help you match, right? Like they can write you strong letters. Sometimes if you impress, like like with, with Dr. Wiseman and, and I, like we have externs sometimes that come and work and, and through these types of programs. And we're like, this particular student is excellent, right? And even if their scores are low, we'll say, okay, like they're clearly better than what their CV shows. And then we'll recommend them or sometimes we'll even take them into our own hospital. So. Um, so if you put yourself in front, in front of the correct group of people, you increase your chances, right? Um, um, so that's number one. Number two is research, right? So I would highly recommend that you get involved clinically. And this is something that we're obviously offering that can help you like, you know, write a manuscript, write a meta-analysis, a, a, a case report, because programs want you to publish when you come. The more you publish under our hospital, our hospital looks more prestigious, right? So we want you to do that. Um, and, then, and then finally, I think if you have not taken your step three, um, and you're an older graduate, I think that's a very big thing that you should do, right? So if you graduated like four or five years ago, we're all gonna ask you like, hey, what have you been doing the past three years and you haven't taken step three? Why not, right? So you could take that to kind of finalize your application. So that, that would be my points for those people. Okay, thank you. So Dr. Weissman, just continuing on the same uh, thread, if you could talk about how to become a stronger applicant in, in the next season, 2023, that's that. And then talk a bit also about uh, the research program that you're running. Yeah. So, you know, uh, we get asked this question a lot, you know, quite a lot. Uh, sometimes the students who are working with us, um, sometimes just other students are emailing. So, you know, we, we, we really feel it's very individualized. Um, it's hard to give a generic and a broad answer for like how you can strengthen your CV. Um, ultimately, it's going to come down to whatever your weaknesses, make that your strength. So you have to look at it like sort of four ways. Um, if, you're, you're, um, if you're lagging in research, let's say you have no publications. So think about it. You're competing with zero publications against somebody who's, com who's coming in with four to five publications. So you're automatically going to be lower down. I mean, there's no way around it. So if you have zero, get yourself at least one publication. If you're somebody who has no U.S. clinical experience from a U.S. physician, get yourself a U.S. clinical experience and a letter. If you're somebody who, who um, is very, has everything great, but just very poor inter interpersonal communication skills, have a, a tutor, have somebody give you prep interviews and, and, and work with somebody closely to get your interpersonal skills up to par. Um, if you're somebody who um, you know, has good interpersonal skills, who has clinical experience and a letter, and the reason you didn't match is because of your scores, take step three to show them, okay, um, now I took step three and that makes up for my score because I'm not going to fail step three. So you have to really be a good advocate and judge for yourself, see where you're lagging and make that a strength. But I would say those four or five domains are everything. Um, U.S. clinical experience, research, good interpersonal skills, um, and, and um, good scores. You have those five, you're golden. And the key is to find which one or even sometimes two you're lacking in and reverse that. I think that's really where I would go. And that's what we advise our residents, I mean, our, our medical students to, to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, now let, let's continue down the research path. You know, Talk to us a bit about the research program that you're running. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so just briefly, um, you know, I, I could talk about research for, for a long time, but um, I, um, so I, I direct the research program here in our hospital, um, the Hackensack Hospital with the medical students in Hackensack um, and our, our, res our residents, our junior residents in the program, um, as well as, you know, Dr. Two's program and a lot of the other programs. And um, one thing that we, we, we do um, is we, we offer a research course. Because um, our goal is not ultimately to help you get published, but teach you how to do research on your own. Um, and kind of walk the pro walk you through the process of it. So what we do is we have small groups um, and we we work on one to two papers um, a month with them. And you know, with the group, um, we teach you how to do meta analyses. We lecture you in retrospective studies, and then ultimately we put you on a paper um, with a publication that you helped over the month do. So a you're going to look good because you um, not only did you 
have a publication, but you also can tell the hospital, okay, I actually took a course and I actually know how to do research for you. So you could say those words to them and this will look very good for you. Okay. Uh, before we dive into the questions, uh, there's one key aspect uh, that we haven't spoken about and that is the letter of uh, recommendations, you know, how to make it more customized, personalized. So what do the programs look for when it comes to the letters? Uh, Dr. Atut, maybe you can take this. Sure. sure. So um, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure if, if uh, people on the chat know this, but when you guys apply and you're creating your ERAS application, when you submit a letter of recommendation, one of the questions that you get asked for is the person that's submitting this letter, are they a faculty member? Are they a program director? Are they a chair of a department? So those are differentiated. So as a program director, when I open up your application, so, so if you look at it from my window, right, it will show me your picture, your ERAS application, and on the bottom, it'll tell me his letters are submitted by a program director or it's submitted by a chair of a department or a faculty member, right? So, so obviously those hold different tiers. It's harder to get a letter from a program director and it's much harder to get um, a letter from faculty members and let's say community doctors in the community. So for you guys, obviously those letters like are tiered. So you wanna try to get them from chairs of departments, program directors, associate PDs, and core faculty. Those are the most important. And then below that is just the regular physicians in the community, right? Um, and then things that we look for in the letter is did you work closely with this person, right? Sometimes even if we recognize these doctors, I mean, there's only like two or 300 program directors in the country. So we generally know each other, we meet each other at conferences. So if I know a program director wrote you a letter, I might call him and say, hey, you worked with so-and-so, I got a letter, um, what do you think of this person? So, so recognizing each other also helps. And we look for things like, did you have direct contact with patients? Did you help with research? Did you, what kind of work ethic? And generally, you know, they write positive things. It's a letter of recommendation, but who writes it and, and with the institution that they represent is very important. Thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, so again, to the audience, uh, you know, if you need more details on the research program, on the rotations, uh, go to our website, it's all listed there. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, you can get in touch with us. But uh, let me now get into the Q&A. We have a lot of questions and I'm aware of the time constraints as well. Uh, first question, how big is a red flag if I have a year of graduation more than five years? And, and related question I got was, I have more than 10 years of year of graduation, but I have a home country residency. So mm -hmm. if one of you can talk about year of graduation and uh, how big of a flag is that? Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, so, you know, um, the, you're not, so just to, quick, to clarify it a little bit, you're not filtered by year of graduation. It's not like we set a filter. Okay, if you graduated before 2018, you're not gonna be seen. Of course, you're gonna be seen. Now, we're gonna look for continuity. So. If you graduated you know, now or last year, then you don't really have to do much explaining of what you did the last year because you just graduated. Now, if you graduated two years ago, you have to say, okay, in the last two years, when I'm when, just in my view a little bit, um, I'm looking at somebody graduated two years ago. So in the last two years since your graduation, what did you do? Did you um, join a gym membership, um, which is fine, but we want to see that you, um, you know, you also you know, did some research, you, um, you know, you, you, you worked with um, a doctor for three months, um, you mm -hmm. see things like this to show us that you just really not not only that you're interested in medicine, but you didn't lose your skills for medical school, because <laughs> that's a concern we have if you graduated, let's say five years ago, you know, if I would stop practicing medicine for five years, I would not be the same type of doctor, I, I would be worse, much worse. So have you put uh, um, yourself in a position to kind of justify this time break. And, and that's fine if you graduated two, three, four, five years ago, but you've done you know, a year of research and then you've done um, a couple months of clerkship here and then you were a scribe for a year. So you did things that kind of put you in the medical field. It will um, kind of narrow that, that difference and that gap. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question comes, uh, if I have a step one score prior to uh, you know, it becoming pass fail, Will it still be a filter if I have lower step one scores or will you just say it's a pass? Yeah, so so that's a good question. Unfortunately, I I personally, you know, uh, think that they should blind these scores, but they but the ACGME decided not to. So if you took your step one score and it has a numerical value, as a program director, I will still be able to see that numerical value. It will not show step pass fail. Um, 
So uh, me personally, the way I'm going to look at it is I'm just going to look at it as you passed it and you failed it. But I will tell you, like, it's difficult. Like, I'm not going to, I probably wouldn't hold a low score against you. But if you got a phenomenal score, like you got 250, 260, we're not going to like probably ignore that. That's still very difficult to achieve, right? And, you know, you're dealing with human beings. Ultimately, they're going to see a 250 and they're going to be very impressed. But if you got like a low score, I don't think it's fair to put you in the same pool as somebody who got a low score too, but his says pass and yours says you know, 200, right? So we're probably going to remove that. Your step two now is going to become the monster in the room. That's the most important one because that's the categorical number that will be used to filter most likely. Um, and then if you're an older graduate, I think your step three, whether you took it or not, will also be utilized. Now, to, to Simka's point on the last question, so, um, you know, we personally don't filter. Our program doesn't. But I know for a fact that a lot of programs do filter based on graduation year. So I, I, a lot of my colleagues that are program directors if you're more than five years of graduation, they will not look at your application, right? So um, we don't, because I want to give everybody a fair chance, but I, but a lot of hospitals do. So this is why it's very important that when you guys are in your in those gap years that you're doing a lot of clinical work, that you're not just you know sitting there. It, it, there are many times in the interview, I'll ask residents like, hey, how, you graduated five years ago, how do you keep up your medical knowledge? And like, I'll just, they'll go into like a blank stare, like, you know, they're like, oh, like I, I did questions when I studied for, and that's it. That's not good enough. Medicine is so rapidly changing that if you're not clinically involved, you will be absolutely obsolete within a couple of years. So um, you don't want to come into residency being so far behind, you know, right. so, um, so that's, that's about it. Okay. Thank you. Now, continuing on the same thread, I got a question. Uh, this is for IMGs who are outside the US and how can they improve the CV? Of course, we spoke about, uh, you know, your program, uh, Dr. Weissman and Dr. Atwood on the research and tele-rotation. So obviously, these things will help the tele-rotation, maybe the tele-research. What else can they do if they are outside the US to improve their CV? Should they be working or what else do you think? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, if, if you're going to be working and, and, and you get a job, that's fine. Um, obviously, you'd want a job as maybe like a medical scribe or um, as a research position or a job um, in, in, in some sort of way that you can sort of withhold some of the academia or medical, you know, clinical skills of internal medicine or medicine in general for whatever you're applying to. But to take, you know, to take a job as, as, as like a Lyft driver or a job is like a bank, that, that's not going to reflect positively. So, um, you know, you would, you would get a job, but get the job in the field and still try to do maybe like one month, one month of U.S. clinical experience under a physician um, to write you a letter. But still, you can have a job as like something in the medical community. Thank you. Uh, another question which comes up very frequently, and especially now with the Ukraine situation, how important is the MSP for IMGs when it comes to the application? And, and you know, the specific question is, I graduated from Ukraine, and obviously it's in a crisis, I may not be able to receive my MSP. So how important is an IMG MSPE in general? So, um, so you're going to need it to apply. An MSPE is required by ERAS to have a complete application. Now, to be quite honest with you, it's not something that I review too well, too much when I'm uh, going through applicants, right? It's not something that's very high on my personal list because I have yet to see a bad MSPE. Every medical school says amazing things about their students. You know, I'll, I'll maybe glance at the scores, but I understand that that's not standardized. So for example, if you took, I don't know, histology in Ukraine, Ukraine, that might not be the same like exact histology course if you took it in Pakistan or Bangladesh, right? Like different, different rulers. So I don't really look at that to filter, but I think ERAS require it's required by ERAS that MSPE be uploaded for you to even apply. So um, you might want to make sure that your medical school does that. Okay, thank you. And we already spoke about importance of step three. Mm -hmm. uh, we already spoke about the criteria I use to filter out. Okay, step three, lot of questions, lot of questions on step three. So maybe one of you can uh, just uh, talk about uh, about step three again and the importance of step three because I see 10 questions in a row. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one too. So, so look, if, if you have, if you're a recent graduate, like you graduated within a year or two and you have good scores, there's probably no reason to take step three because your CV is good enough as is, you just need clinical experience and a little bit of research, which would help. However, if you have a low step one score, 
you know, we're going to ask you about that. So a good answer to that question would be like, you know, when I took step one, I didn't, you know, I didn't know how to study specifically. Maybe I didn't have the right resources. I learned from that. I did well on step two. And to make up for that low step one score or failure, I took my step three and I passed it. Because you have to understand as a program director, what are we worried about when we see a low step one score? What does that ultimately represent? It represents that when you come into our hospital, you might fail the medical board. That's really what it comes down to. It's essentially representing that you did really poor in step one. That correlates with how you do on the medical board. And we do not want any resident that's under our training failing the medical board. It makes the hospital look bad that we trained you and then you couldn't pass the board, right? So the way you can ease that discomfort if you have a low step one score is show them, I took step three and I passed it comfortably. Uh, and then that also correlates with uh, the, the pass board. So. So that way the, they can make a case for you, right? If you have phenomenal scores, you have 240s, 250s, you don't need to go through that, uh, the step three. But if you don't, and you're an older graduate, I think it's a very good thing to have. Um, it, it, it strengthens your application. Thank you, thank you. Uh, another question for one of you um, is around transcripts. So, you know, medical school transcripts, how important are these? Um, yeah, sure. I could jump on that. So, um, you know, when it comes to medical school transcript, I, obviously part of the um, application you're going to, from Eros, you're going to need to have your transcript uploaded by your school or, or by someone who can upload it, you know, directly from your school. So you're going to need it there. However, however, um, your basic science grades really don't mean that much to us. Um, general, usually we won't look at it. Um, um, if we do, it would just be making sure there aren't a lot of C's. Um, you know, A's, B's, a mixture, just to make sure that your basic sciences were, were semi-decent um, is really the only thing we're going to look at that, um, you know, that that's transcript. That's more just like for formality purposes that it has to be there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think like as, that you have like a, a pass, a good score in the, in the residency that you're applying for. So like for me, for the transitional year residents, I might get residents that are applying for radiology or anesthesia or dermatology, right? So they'll, or, or even internal medicine, half of our program goes into medicine uh, after. So like, you know, if you're applying for radiology, but then you got, you know, a very poor score in your radiology rotation, I'm going to ask you about that. But, you know, but otherwise, it's not really something that we dive too deep into. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, of course, uh, there's a question around uh, CS. So let's say someone failed CS, but now, of course, with OET, they cleared OET and, yeah. and the CS failure still shows up on the on the transcript. How How, how do you view such things? The CS failure. Don't look at it anymore. That's oh, it. okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Again, it's not fair. It's, it's, it would not be fair to have two different rulers. That's it. It's a new rule now. There is no CS. Step one is pass fail. That's the way it should be viewed by everybody. Yeah. And what is your opinion on uh, some applicants applying to both transitional year and categorical? You know, many IMGs do that. And a related question I'm getting is, multiple specialties so i am and fm in the same hospital how, how do you uh, you know assess that so so everybody that does apply to transitional year also applies for categorical so for those of you that don't know what transitional year is it's essentially a preliminary program where you are matched into a one year with us and then that year you do you essentially like we create a schedule for you um, so that you're able to get pgy2 im positions pgy2 fm neurology so if you're going into certain subspecialties, right, like ophthalmology, dermatology, radiology, anesthesia, PMNR, you have to do one year of prelim medicine, either an in internal medicine, surgery, or transitional year. Out of those three, transitional year is the most competitive because you create your own schedule during that time. And then when you do it, you're very likely to match into that next year after, right? There's not that many transitional year spots in the US. So, um, so no, you should apply to category. If, if you are applying for neurology, for example, yeah, you should apply for prelim spots for category for uh, uh, transitional or medicine, and then you should apply to neurology. So you can match in one and then the other. Um, if you want to do medicine, you should apply to both, right? Like half my program out of the 18 spots, me and Simka, like we take eight positions we, for people that are going into subspecialty, and we keep 10 positions for people that we feel may not have like the best CV, but are showed us that they're hardworking through these types of things that we do. And then we take them. We, we make them an excellent candidate for the medicine program the year after, and we match them into PGY2 or, or uh, medicine programs the year after. So you should apply to both. Um, as, and, and then the, to your last point, as far as applying to both 
family medicine and internal medicine in the same hospital, that's really institution dependent. Some institutions will look poorly on that. If it's a small hospital and the two program directors talk, it may look bad. Um, I would highly advise you just apply to one or the other in that particular hospital. But then if you want to apply to different, like some hospitals just have medicine without FM, apply. You can apply there. But if they have both, I would just pick one. Okay. Uh, next question. So, you know, let's say I have gaps in my CV. So mm -hmm. how do you want me to address that in the personal statement or not at all? How should I deal with the gaps? So maybe one of you, Dr. Weissman. Sure. Yeah, so it touched on what we said earlier. So any gap you have, um, you know, so I mean, this is already to the point where like the gap is over, right? You're not like, it's not like you're now have a thing to do, but you, let's say for example, you already have a two-year gap in your CV and, you're, and you're, you're saying, okay, I'm applying for the 2023 match, you know, um, in March, what can I do? Because I already have a gap. So if you already have a two, three, four, five-year gap, um, Again, you could what you can do is you can you can do experience now and do research now and show that you can say, listen, I have a gap, but I still um, I, I still impressed you know this group of doctors with um, with my clinical work, um, or I still did research after to show that I'm still very interested in medicine. So you can sort of just at least now jump on the wagon and say, okay, I'm gonna. I know I had a gap. Um, that I was dealing with a family issue, financial issue, whatever it was. But at least now I sort of am showing without, you know, telling. But this goes back to just showing I'm interested in medicine. I still not know my medical knowledge. I'm still interested in research um, post facto. Thank you. And I know we spoke about uh, letters. Uh, so there's one question. How do you view a home country LOR? Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, listen. So, if you don't have any letters, um, you need as a minimum to upload three. So, if you really just don't have any, sure. I mean, you need it. You need it. Take it. But, you know, uh, the the reason that we really want to see letters from United States doctors is because the healthcare system is very different here. Um, there, there's, um, the modality, the imaging is very different. Um, there's different availabilities. There's different treatments, different medications that we give. So, you know, a letter from there doesn't tell us that you know how to practice medicine here. Right. It, it's I'll give you an example. Like, let's say somebody has a met, uh, is applying for internal medicine, um, but says they were they, they, they were very good at radiology in a letter. So, you know, it's it's good. OK, so he's good at radiology. But like, how, how do I know he could be a good internal medicine candidate in my program? So if you don't have anything, sure. But um, ultimately, it's not going to be the ideal way to go. OK, uh, so Dr. Atwood, maybe you can take the next one. If I have a home country residency, does this give me an advantage if I'm applying? Yes. Yeah, it does. It, it obviously, it means that you're, um, you know, you've been practicing medicine. So you're obviously something, somebody that knows medicine, hopefully well, right. And can bring a new perspective. You know, I, I'm, I'm all about like uh, intellectual diversity. I love when doctors come from all over the world and bring new things to, to, to medicine that we see. Right. Um, uh, however, you know, it, it really would, depend on like how long your gap was, how long ago was this residency training that you did and what did you do in the time in between? But it's certainly a positive, of course. Okay. And related question, how important are jobs like medical assistant, physician assistant, if I'm in the US and I can get those jobs? So they're, they're good, right? Like, cause you're clinically involved. Um, but I don't think they're a substitute. Like working as a PA is not the same thing as doing an externship or an observership with academic faculty, because ultimately you're trying to match into certain institutions. So it's better than nothing, right? So if you're, if you're gonna pick between, you know, doing Uber and doing that, do that, right? Like, like Dr. Wiseman just said, but, um, but at the same time, make sure that you have specific externships, observerships, clinical work that you're doing that's guided specifically for residency. Uh, but otherwise I think those jobs are, are good. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Weissman, uh, since we spoke about uh, tele rotations, and you know, uh, let's talk about some of the continuing importance of tele rotations. Will they continue to hold the value, and how do programs assess the letters from these tele rotations? You know, we are running this program on tele rotations, so. Yeah, this is a very good question, and um, it was a question that Dr. I, uh, Dr. Tud and I um, kind of sat down, and we spoke to um, probably two or three different um, program directors, um, different core faculty members of other programs, not just our program. I already spoke to our program, but other programs, um, and we said, what kind of weight, um, 
would, would what what kind of um, you know what do we think now um, that COVID is sort of phasing out and um, people can get more and more hands-on experience? What do we think? And um, a lot, a lot of the 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 answers that that people were giving us was, you know what? Um, and and this comes from sometimes the students saying my tele my virtual or slash quote unquote tele rotation was very good. Is that you know a lot of times, for example, when we have a, a resident, let's say in our um, you know let's say a resident, let's say a medical student comes to a hospital um, on a rotation or comes to an office, they don't always get as good attention um, and as good training as if you are um, at least with our tele rotation. I can't talk for other ones. I don't know how they run, but um, the fact that like we are one on one interacting with the screen shared of patient labs and imaging, and we can really um, give them the information um, in a very controlled and safe environment, um, holds a lot, a lot of weight. So um, before we move on to the letter, the fact that they we're able to really give them good, like, because if you're, let's say you're, you're looking at a patient in the hospital, mm -hmm. um, it's hard to learn a week or three days hospitalization for, let's say, you know, cellulitis or CHF exacerbation. You, you can only maybe get like one point here, one key point here, at least with a program director, right? You're not going to have that much continuity. But if you have an hour session about a hospital stay, it really does hold a lot of weight and it, and it's great clinical um, experience and, and, and the letter will reflect that. So just touching on the letter. So, you know, it, in the letters, we, we never, we, we, we stay away from saying things like, you know, he did this in this setting or in this office. We, we kind of talk um, as if we know the student well, and we are saying, okay, I worked, um, you know, we, we discussed a lot of medicine together. We rounded together. We spoke about and discussed a lot of patient care together. And I can honestly say, that this student um, has a very good grasp of medical knowledge um, based on the fact that we discussed heart, you know, heart failure, cellulitis, MI, arrhythmias, and abdominal pain. So you're kind of telling the people that like you give their approval and their stamp based on things. So just to kind of summarize what I'm saying is that telerotations have been so successful during the COVID era that they're actually becoming very legitimate and they actually go through like the VSLO now. Through, so um, even U.S. schools, U.S. medical schools are approving these as actual core rotations. Correct. By the way, we just booked a few medical schools. They're they're approving these as core core rotations um, because it was so successful. And because of that, the letters are going to be equally reflective of this. Thank you. And maybe you can also talk about the six month program uh, that we are offering. Uh, you know the rotations, tele rotations, research. So yeah. can you throw uh, some yeah, light? Yeah, yeah. So you know one of the the things and more of a new project that we 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 started um is is really for for students um who obviously you know need one like one aspect like research or or, or um you know a letter recommendation or clinical experience. They they need more than just like one of those. So we, what we said is listen, let's provide a full package because a lot of students a they don't know where to go uh, to get one. Never mind all three of those. Um, they don't know where to get um, the package from. And if they do get like a research rotation here and then, um, you know, an externship at the Mayo Clinic, and then it would cost them an exuberant sum of money. So what we said is, listen, let's as, as, as affordable as we can get it and as practical as we can get it, let's offer a full package. Let's offer a six month package, which will include a virtual rotation, um, hospital based medicine, hospital stays, real patients without their the patient there kind of. Um, sort of distracting you, but their physical exam findings, their imaging, their labs, and their assessment and plan and treatment, we can offer that with a two-month research rotation. With three months of hands-on clinical experience guaranteeing three letters of recommendation from U.S. faculty, we can put that together for a student for a more reasonable um, uh, um, financial plan. This will be the ultimate way to have students be ideal candidates, fill all their gaps, um, in, in a very uh, reasonable way. So that's really where this comes in. And I, I, I think um, it's, it's gonna be invaluable um, for the 2023 match and going forward. Yeah, Thank forward. you. And, and yes, if uh, any one of you needs more information that is on our website and we'll be happy to answer uh, questions on that. Uh, Dr. Artur, did you have anything? Yeah, I just, I just wanna highlight this. this. This is very important, right? So this program that, 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 that you guys have now essentially covets all three aspects that are very important, right? So you're, you're getting hand clinical experience in the US, you're getting telemedicine rotations, which is the same thing, like these rotations that you're going to be in are essentially what we do for our own residents. So telemedicine for the good or the bad is here to stay. It's not going anywhere, right? And so um, this is now part of our academic structure. Like, like every week we have didactics with our residents and those same exact didactics are what 
you're going to get in this rotation. So you're essentially sitting through like residency level medicine. So you're more prepared when you come in for the actual hands-on experience in the offices and in the hospital, then, then essentially like you're more prepared. You're, the, you're impressing the faculty, you're impressing people like me and, and Wiseman, et cetera, they give you stronger letters. So that way you cover everything and you're getting a publication or two out of it. You're learning how to do research. So I think that pretty much covers everything. And IMG really needs to be like a strong applicant, to be honest. Okay. Thank you. And Dr. Atut, I know you may have to leave, but perhaps one last question, if you can stay. Uh, many of the IMGs have home country residencies in a different specialty. So they may have dermatology, they may have OBGYN. Uh, but because of the competitiveness here or for whatever reasons, they are trying to switch to say I am or something else. How do you view that switch? So as an internal medicine doctor, I think internal medicine is the greatest residency on earth. So um, I had scores where I could have applied to other specialties. I chose this because I think, I think it's a phenomenal way to take care of patients. Um, it makes you all encompassing. So I'm biased, right? I, I would say do medicine instead of derm. Uh, I think you having a dermatology background will make you a stronger internal medicine physician uh, or subspecialist within internal medicine. But um, but no, but, I mean, that's not a bad thing. I think yeah. that's a good thing. Yeah, if I could just, um, you know, reinforce and add one little point to that. So um, because let's say, for example, you're somebody who, and we we actually have someone like this now, we're coming, coming to our program. So we did a surgery residency in Pakistan and now is applying for internal medicine. So when we're interviewing them, you know, we, we, we um, want to make sure that they're, they really do want to do internal medicine um, because they did the surgery there. So we want to see, you know, did you have a publication in internal medicine? D did you um, actually do two months or three months of internal medicine rotation? Because this would kind of be going back to telling us without telling us. Tell us you're interested in internal medicine without sitting there interview. Oh, I love medicine. I hate surgery. I, I don't know why I did surgery. I really love medicine. So without saying a, a childish statement like that, you can maturely say, listen, and we, people said this stuff. People did emergency medicine. We have like two, three people like this. I did internal, you know, I, I was an emergency, even in the States, I did emergency medicine at SUNY Upstate. I want to come to your program at Hackensack. Um, I want to do internal medicine. And, and then I say to them, you know, um, you know, that's great. And I, I think medicine is great, but like, is this like a last minute decision or you sort of had this in your mind for a while and said, yeah, yeah no, no, I actually, you know, I did two publications in medicine. I did three months of um, rot rotation since then in internal medicine. And then I said, okay, no, I, I agree with you. Now I think you really do want medicine. So it's just a way of, you know, telling us more officially. Yeah, but one, no one, wants to be, nobody wants to be the backup, right? Like we don't, we're not exactly. like, like, you're not, you know, I, as a program director, if I ever feel that like you really want anesthesia, but you're just applying to us as a backup, we're not going to, even if your scores are phenomenal, we're not going to take you. Right. We want people that are passionate about the field that once they come in, they have an appreciation for it and can be the best doctors possible. I mean, but you need to have a passion for the field in order to be that. OK, thank you. Uh, I have 50 other questions in the list, as I can see. So uh, possibly we are not going to get through all of those. Uh, but again, if Dr. Atut, you need to leave, uh, please feel free. I'm, I'm we, good. If I, if I, I, I mean, I still have like 25 minutes. OK, so, so <laughs> I'll keep going down the list. I, uh, should I or should I not address low scores in the personal statement? Um, I think your CV will address that more than your personal statement, to be honest, right? Um, you, I mean, you can. It depends on like how your personal statement is structured. Um, but I mean, I think you'd be better off in your personal statement explaining like your journey rather than like explaining an error in your CV. Um, I think you can in the interview, you can tell them like, hey, I did poorly in step one for X, Y, and Z reasons, because it will come up. And then tell them like, I took step three if you're an older grad and I made up for it. I think that's as good of, a, as good of an explanation as you can possibly give. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, I'm a nurse practitioner in critical care. Should I stop working and get externship positions over the summer or continue in my current job? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, listen. Every, it's it, ultimately it comes to every down to everyone's finances. Um, but putting everything aside, if you're looking at it through a lens of like a a program director, associate, or somebody who part of the interview panel, you know, we we want to see U.S. clinical experience um, under a trained U.S. physician. Um, so you know, re, re, kind of regardless of, of what else is going on or what else you're doing, we really do want to see that. So. You know, even if it could be like virtually, um, you can do like you can work, continue working if that's what your finances need. But you can do like a, a virtual clinical rotation um, in the evenings um, on your time and sort of won't interfere with your job. That's great because ultimately we just want to see it. We don't care what it is, how it is. We just need to see it there. So, 
Okay. Uh, next question again, very common that we see gaps during the medical school. So a lot of IMGs have to take a break either because they couldn't get the electives or they were preparing for the steps. Uh, so how do you view, uh, Dr. Hatwood, the gaps within the medical school and extension of the degree? Yeah, I mean, I, it really depends on the gap and the reason, right? So for example, if you had to take a leave of absence for disciplinary reasons or because you couldn't pass. And so like, that's a different story than, for example, if like, you know, you're a single mother, you have kids, you couldn't afford to pay the tuition for the school. And so you had to go work so you can pay the tuition. Those are two different stories, right? It depends on the reason. Obviously, we're human beings. We understand that, you know, if you had to take a, a leave of absence, personal reason. I had a resident that took an entire year off between her third and fourth year because um, uh, her mother passed away and her father, who's elderly and ill, needed taken care of. And so she took time to take care of him. I understand that, right? But when she came back, she did phenomenal on her exams. She did research. She did this to make up for that. And that's fine, you know. But if you took an entire year that's unexplained and you did nothing during that time, that's bad. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe the other question you can also answer, which is, if I want to do pediatrics after transitional year, yep. is that easy or is that not the, the regular path? Yeah, I mean, I think you should apply to pediatrics directly. But if, if let's say you end up matching in a prelim program like transitional year, you do do a lot of pediatrics during that year too. Like we, you have at least a month and then you can build your electives towards that. And then you look like a much more a, you know, competitive applicant when you apply for the categorical pediatric position. And the program obviously puts its way to help you. Like we push for you, we call program directors on your behalf. So, um, so I think you should do both. Okay. Uh, another question, uh, which we are beginning to see nowadays is, uh, I got into fellowship. Uh, now do you think I can get into residency? So the reverse, you know, some, some fellowships like geriatrics, nephrology, Yep. can take uh, IMGs directly. So do you think they can get back into residency? Yes, uh, I mean, so I'll take that one too. So sim uh, yes, obviously you're going to, you're gonna look more competitive, right? Like you already finished a fellowship. So it, most programs will take you. And a lot of these, it's not a typical route to do fellowship first and then go back to residency. Um, however, a lot of hospitals that do accept you for these fellowships because they can't fill them, sometimes like, push you into their categorical medicine department in the same hospital. So it's kind of like how they convince people to come to do these uh, non-competitive fellowships. So, but it does make you more competitive. It's clinical work, of course. Okay. Uh, so I have an attempt on step one, uh, you know, we, uh, will programs filter me out or how does the filter criteria work for a lot of these programs? Yeah, so, you know, so until now, there, we set a, a threshold, a score, usually not high, usually low, because we want to get a good pool to look through their CVs um, and through their research and through their clinical experience. But we said, we do set it, we did it in the past, set a score. Now that it's going to pass fail, you know, there's going to be no filter there. So we're going to get, um, we got 2,100 applicants this, uh, you know, time we interviewed 240 um, now we're gonna get um, we're we're gonna we're gonna be looking through actually the 2100 ourselves with our hands. Um, every core faculty is gonna have like 300 or 400 to go through by hands, um, and then pick you know 10 or 15 for the interview. So what it's gonna do now is um, it's not gonna, there's gonna be no filter there, but it's gonna be, we're just gonna everything else is gonna shine out brighter on your CV and gonna carry more weight. Um, it's like almost like a test. And if the test has, you know, 50 multiple choice questions, you know, each question is a little bit, but now let's say there's 10 questions on the exam. Each question is huge. So that's sort of how it is. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question. I got C's and D's in my med school, but two sixties in the USMLEs. Uh, how would you assess this applicant, uh, as a PD? There's something wrong with your medical school. <laughs> <laughs> how do you get C's and then two sixty? Something doesn't add up. Uh, okay. it's, not something, it's not something that I think the 260 obviously it's a standardized exam it's going to weigh a lot more but uh, m I have no idea why you would get C's in medical school uh, and then do get a 260 that doesn't correlate but, but yeah. it's, it's to you <laughs> okay questions on how can I apply to the six month program uh, so look at our website all details are, are there uh, you can apply and we are flexible with the times that you do the the on-site rotation in case you're not getting the visa. And there is a lot of flexibility 
on how you pick uh, the rotations. Uh, so that's that. And one more thing uh, I want to add, and a lot of students have asked, been asking me this, um, you know, you know, let's say, you know, I'm not IG, it's hard for me to get into the country. Do you help me with assistance? Yes. So the answer is yes. Like for the um, six month program, we're, we're really trying to, to help you out and put everything together for you. So we, we offer you assistance, um, you know, visa assistance letters. So to try to get you expedited, to try to get you in, to try to allow yourself to showcase yourself and, and get everything you need to apply. So, yeah. Okay. Um question again a question on step three if i finish it after september so i'm assuming this is after the era submission deadline uh do you still consider it or you you don't uh, go back to my application so it's tough right like sometimes um we don't go back once we send out like we have three three waves of interviews that we do and then generally we don't go, but like once those are submitted and um, once those are sent out and they're sent out on a month to month. So like we send out the first one, I think in like October, then one in November, one in December. And then after that, we don't really go back to the pool of applicants unless somebody like declines an interview for whatever reason or drops out, then we'll go back to pick one more. Um, so I my advice to you is the best thing you can do is have everything prepared right when you apply, right? Try to time it so that everything's there Right, all your letters, all your personal statements, everything. Obviously, the letters that you will get from our, uh, if you would join our program, uh, they're merit-based, but we haven't had anybody who joined who did not get a letter yet. So once you join, our letters will be uploaded on time. So, so at least you know that you'll have university letters that are uploaded on time from program directors. And then um, your personal statement should make sure it's up to date. And step three, like if you can get it, when you apply, it's better for you rather than having to send it to programs again. Remember when you're sending that out, all the, pro like we as program, we're getting literally, literally, like I kid you not, like hundreds of emails a day during interview season. So like you're, you're gonna be one of those hundreds. So it's better to just apply with a full application if you can, it's better for you. Yeah, yeah, and one more point to add, and so we I saw this on, on some of the interviews. So let's say for example, somebody didn't have research and they applied in September, no problem. Um, um, but, and by the way, if you do a research and it's, even if it's not published by the application, you just, all you have to hit is submitted. It's been submitted by there and it, it, that looks very good for you as well. It means you've done it. It's just, you know, it's just, everybody knows it takes time for journals to give you answers. Yeah. So that's fine. But even like, if you come to the interview in say October or November and it's, and you know, and it says on your thing, oh, I have no research or, or you don't have um, good letters, but then you say, you know what, actually last month, I just did a research course or last month, you know, in September, October, November, I, I did, um, I, I published a paper and you tell them about it that that does get you know obviously that's great because you're updating it you're kind of giving them an in-person update of what you've done in the past few months so mm -hmm. uh, so dr weissman maybe we can discuss this as well so the the six months program currently runs april through september but i'm assuming we have some flexibility if someone wants to start maybe in may and go to october so some kind of a rolling basis are we flexible on that yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so good question. So, um, we, we, this, this six month program, um, we, what we're going to do is, um, we've been kind of saying, listen, we, we offer two months of research. Um, so every, um, so if you, you missed the April four, uh, 18th, um, start, so, um, you can, you can do the June 18th. So every two months we'll rerun the six month program. So you can jump in in June. Um, and, and, and the same thing will apply to August 18th as well. You could jump in in August and, and, and the, my point is that even if you're still applying for this match, if you jump in in August, you can still say, okay, this research paper has been submitted. Um, and then when you come to the interview, okay, I have these letters now. So it's never really too late. And, and obviously for the next year cycle, starting, let's say, um, you'd say um, October, like you join in October, it'll be for the next year cycle. So it's fine. So the key is to just, um, whenever you're able to jump on the van wagon, um, do it and everything will sort of work, work its way out. And if my CV is very, let's say, psychiatry focused, how will the six month program help me? Should I consider this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so exactly. So this is the thing. So with a six month program, you can display everything you want for medicine, family and internal medicine, because you're going to say, listen, you're going to have two publications in medicine. You're going to have three letters of recommendation in internal medicine. You're going to have done a hospital based rotation in internal medicine. So in virtually, so you, no matter what you had prior, you, any anybody interviewing you, I I would be very shocked if somebody interviewing you is still not convinced that you like medicine and family and internal medicine and you're interested in that. No matter if you worked as a surgeon for 50 years, if you did six months, you could say argue. It's not just like a week. I did. I did six months 
I really want medicine. I think anybody would be convinced by that. I, I can't, I, we would, I can't imagine any of our colleagues would, would not be so. Yeah. Thank you. And maybe uh, Dr. Atur, the last question before uh, you can maybe wrap up. How do you assess the quality of a published paper as a PD when you see this in the CV? So honestly, for me, it's, it's um, depends on a couple of things. So uh, any publication is a positive publication. There is no such thing as like he published in this journal or he did this. Like, like, yeah, obviously, like if you publish in a New England journal, that's amazing, right? Um, but not too many people do that. And so um, I, we just want to see that you are interested in research, right? Because when you join our residency, you're going to be part of the research committee, right? You're, you're going to be involved with papers because we're an academic program. So we just want to see that you're interested in research. You know how to do research, right? And, um, and the most important thing for me is like, when we're interviewing you is like, I want you to know the paper. So like, like if you publish something, I'm going to ask you, Hey, this is an interesting paper. Like it's a cancer patient with, this type of thing. can you tell me about this paper? Like, so just make sure if you publish something, put it on your CV that you, you understand it enough to be able to have a conversation about it. Right. I've had certain people that completely couldn't tell me anything about the paper. And I'm like, well, you know, that means that means you didn't really do it. Right. So um, just make sure you know it, but Research is very good, especially if you're applying for subspecialty too. If you're applying for medicine, it'll make you match into higher tier programs, which is even better. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think we are coming at the top of the hour. So thank you to both our panelists, Dr. Weissman, Dr. Atur. And before we leave, uh, any, any parting thoughts, Dr. Atur or Dr. Weissman? No, I mean, I, I, hope, I hope we can see you guys join our program. I mean, these lectures that you're going to have um, virtually, uh, will be done by um, myself and Dr. Weisman. So you'll see how like academic faculty teach in, um, in the university, how academic faculty teach in, in, for our residents. Um, and then hopefully it'll be like smaller groups. So we'll have more of an intimate setting. So we're able to know each other a little bit more and uh, see how everybody does. And our goal ultimately guys is to help each and every one of you uh, become the best physician and, and get you to the best residency that you can get to. Thank you, Dr. Atut. Uh, Dr. Weisman. Yes, um, absolutely. So, so thanks again for organizing this. Um, and to just to, you know, to echo uh, what Dr. Toot was saying, you know, ultimately, we want to help you. We want to help you match. We want to see you succeed. Um, even if it's not to our program, that's fine. But um, we, we kind of want to recognize the talent that's in a lot of these other parts of the, of the world and, and not just kind of keep the window open for the American grads. We want to sort of give you guys the opportunity, kind of put it in front of you saying, listen, this is what you need to do. This is how you get it. Um, and now it's, it's, it's kind of up to you. Um, to, to do. Um, so, so um, you know, and that's, I always like to say the famous thing, you know, you can, you can bring a, you know, you can bring a, um, a camel, you can bring a horse to the water, but you can't make a drink. So you can, we, you know, we, we can tell you what you need to do, but ultimately it's going to be um, in your decision to say, okay, I want this, I got to follow this X and Y and Z pathway to get there. Um, and we really hope that um, we, we really do get talent from India, from Pakistan, from Asia, um, um, talent that should be, um, positions here in the United States, and there's no reason that they, they can't be. So we're going to try to do everything we can to allow you guys to do that. Thank you both for a very, very informative session. I appreciate your time. I'm sure uh, the attendees as well. And uh, we'll see you later very soon. Thank you both. Thank you, everyone.